Welcome to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast, your guide to future tech trends and innovation in a language you understand. Now, over to your host, Neil Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast. Do you have your own tech startup? Are you thinking about different ways to grab attention at an upcoming event and actually get people to your booth? If so, you're going to love today's guest. He's got an incredibly unique story that took him from South Africa to New York, and today he's in Florida. And we're going to be talking about how the traditional call center is a channel often left out of marketing strategies, and why and how it's actually becoming critical in providing a truly omni-channel experience for customers. Now, today's guest is a serial entrepreneur who has built and self-funded Xylab from the ground up. He's also a keen hiker who has summited Mount Kilimanjaro six times and has also created a culture of bringing his employees to complete the challenge along with him. And he's a fantastic guy and is a whole lot of fun to be around. So buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears to Universal Studios of all places in Florida, where he's waiting to speak with us today. Before we begin the show, can you confirm your exact location? Because I think this is a first in nearly 500 episodes. Okay, so basically in the parking lot of the Universal Studio in Orlando. No way, (laughs) I mean, we had our expo uh, here at Enterprise Connect in uh, in Orlando. So it was it finished yesterday. So we basically all with all my colleagues, we decided to go to Universal Studio. So I'm in the parking lot uh, talking to you. Oh man. (laughs) It's nice and sunny and blue skies oh, and t-shirt man. weather and shorts, so it's nice. Okay, sorry to to share it with you. No oh, man, have you been on any rides while you were there as well? <laughs> you, did you get on any rides? No, I went to the first <laughs> ride and I got so sick. I said, "This is nothing. <laughs> this is it." And I love rides. I really love rides. But you know, one thing I don't like, Neil, you know, is like just queuing. I can't handle queuing anymore. Yeah, I really can't. Same. <laughs> I really can't. I can't. I promise you can't. It's like for me, it's like hell. Like go and sit there and wait for 15 minutes before you get on a ride or 20 minutes. No, that's I passed that. If you know what I mean. And I, I really do, because when I went last year with my son, it hurt. But you know, I paid a little extra so I didn't have to queue because, like you, I just didn't oh, want to go. Just... <laughs> I don't want to spend. I'm too old. And it to... hurts. And you just yeah, <laughs> exactly. And it... And the way you said it, it hurts. It's exactly that. Because la- uh, two years ago, I took my whole family. I've got three kids. So, so, and it's hell for me. It's like, oh, well, do you know you have to bite the bullet? You know. It yeah. Well, it's either that or queue three hours to go on the Hulk. You know, you're not going to do that. Are you? <laughs> I passed that, Neil. I passed that. I passed that. Oh, oh God, just, man. No, you know, you bring... So you don't get caught in traffic. We better get the show on the road, haven't we? Quite literally. So... I'm in a parking lot. So space. There is nothing. My aircon is on. My phone is connected to the Bluetooth. So it's very relaxing here. So take your time. Oh, cool. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Okay. Uh, how far do you want me to go, Neil? I mean, I, do I, how much time you've got? Oh. <laughs> so can I start from the beginning? But anyway, let me kickstart from a little bit of my, my, my background. You know, so I'm actually a heart and soul a software developer, actually. That's how I started my life. In, born in Belgium, Moroccan descent, lived there my whole life until in 94, I decided to, to move to South Africa. I wanted the warm weather. And... Um, so, it's, you know, as a software developer, and then in 98, I decided to start my own business um, identified a big gap actually in, the, in South Africa for the, in, in, in the financial sector. So I created, I wrote my, my, my first banking system actually almost on my own. And later on, I added two, three people and, and it became quite a success in South Africa and, and some neighbor African countries. So it was a good ride. Um, in a certain moment, I owned 70% of the market. So it was really, I mean, I had, had no competition. So it was just the right product, right time. You know the story. Yeah. And then um, in 2008, uh, I was approached by All Mutual. And I know you know, I'm, I'm assuming that you know All Mutual Insurance and Investments, you know, the global listed company. Yeah. So basically, uh, All Mutual wanted to also go into lending as well. And, uh, and then basically, we started a joint venture, was one of the co-founders. Um, and we started this business called Old Future Finance. So one day I was a software developer providing, you know, financial institution with software. And the next moment I was the lender myself. And uh, there was quite also quite a nice uh, journey for the simple reason. I mean, I had all the IT capabilities, you know, so 
we were we were, became almost known like the RT financial institution, and we did uh, we had a good ride there as well. So starting from almost nothing, and then five years later, we had like four thousand or three thousand five hundred people working for us, and branches all over the country. And so another nice story, but uh, it started very nice from a, you know I love starting new businesses, and these are only the two businesses I'm mentioning. I had a couple of others. Um, but I'm not going to go into that. But the thing is that uh, it's nice to start up a business, but at a certain moment it becomes quite co- corporate-like. So that's when I said this is enough now. Uh, we did well here, so we need to go and do something else again. And uh, that's where Xylab, this is the company that's a new startup I started in 2014. Uh, and again, just software. And we're focusing basically, in one, if I can just say it in one sense, it's an omni-channel contact center in the cloud. Okay, so that's simple. And actually, uh, why did I s- decided to go and st- start doing stuff in contact centers? It was actually during the time that I was at the old mutual finance that, uh, you know, I was on the receiving end where I needed to install contact centers, technologies that, that you know, spoke with my, uh, the CRM system, my own CRM system. And it was during that journey that I realized how difficult it was, you know, how difficult it was because I'm an innovator. I like to do things slightly different and use technology as, a, as an enabler. But in fact, I ended up just having, you know, you know the normal stuff that happens in, a, in any contact center, you know, receiving a call and picking it up. And, but I couldn't really get some intelligent stuff in. And, and, and even after they promised me, and I had so many different companies trying, and everybody obviously wanted to get this deal because we have, a, I mean, it's a big name to have all mutual on your books. So everybody was fighting very hard until at the end, I just decided not to do it myself. So I went into the open source world and, and kind of did an okay job. Not a, a brilliant job, but an okay job. Uh, at least slightly better than whatever was proposed to me. So when in 2014 came, when you know, I sold some of my shares at All Mutual Finance, I had some capital that I wanted to reinvest again, and uh, Scilab started. And, 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 and the vision then was actually, let's create a contact center technology which is in the cloud, but it's accessible to everyone. That's like kind of the, 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 our statement, right? And the first thing we need to do is make sure that you can get, that you can get going within a couple of minutes. Literally, go on our website, xylab.com, click on register, get your 14-day free trial. If you're happy, continue using us, right? If you're not happy, yeah, well, then go away, right? And, uh, and you can actually set up a contact center. Literally, we, I mean, we have, our guys can do it in five, min- five minutes and 20 seconds. I'm not saying that everybody can do it in five minutes and 20 seconds, but, <laughs> but the, the idea is that you can do it, you can do it very quickly, right? Uh, so you can get your numbers, you can, and, it's, and, 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 and the second thing that we did was actually also the first globally, is we were first, then the second one we were first, is basically we went and, and again, one of my experiences previously was, you know, when you wanted to buy contact center technology, they, they would ask you thousands of questions just to understand what kind of, which slices you need to buy in the first. So in our case, we don't ask you, we give you everything. We give you SMS, we give you email, we give you web chat, we give you video, we give you a voice, we give you recordings, we give you workforce management, quality assessment, all those features that are typically uh, in a contact center. But you actually pay us, um, and we have a consumption-based model where you only pay us for what you use, the same way as you, you pay for your water and electricity. Again, a first, which is quite a... Uh, interesting to take software and sell it on those bases. And it's very, very simple. So when you go to our website, you'll see the price there and you can, you know, you can, if you have an existing contact center, you can just take the, the minutes you're doing on calls to pop it in and it gives you a price. Or, you know, if you know how many emails you're receiving or how many texts you're sending, the same thing. So it's a, it's a very simple so consumption-based model, no contracts. And again, our statement is in there that if you want to stay with us, stay with us because you love us not because you have to stay with us, you know, and that's not typically what our competitors are doing. <clears throat> so that's actually from an accessibility perspective, right? But then now from a technology perspective. So Neil, the, the, we, you remember we were laughing about queuing, I don't like queuing, and actually it's funny that we spoke about queuing. Yeah. In fact, if you, lo- if you look at contact center technologies, and I'm sure you know it, you know, they all consist of queues, isn't it? Eh? So when you press one, it goes to this queue, when you press two, it goes to that queue, when you when you send an email, it goes to that queue and so forth. And it's actually the, been one of the biggest problems in contact centers technologies is because this queuing thing is actually something that comes from the old days. Uh, we, we literally had queues, you know, a cable and we had people around it. Eh? Yeah. And we kept that same, um, 
we kept it in you know, software until today. Even when I look at people that just launched their new software, then I think, but why are they still keeping using queues? It doesn't make any sense. So in our case, we call it a single waiting room. So just imagine all your interactions, doesn't matter what channel, email, SMS, voice, video, whatever, they all come together into one single waiting room. And even inbound or outbound, doesn't really matter. And then uh, we've got two routings, uh, or routings, uh, as the Americans say. Uh, the one is what we call optimized routing. So what, the, what our um, algorithm does is basically every interaction that's sitting in that, in, in that, uh, in that single waiting room, it tries to match to an agent, right? Yeah. And let's call it, uh, and, and you probably know that uh, skill-based routing is the way that, you know, that contact center technologies are doing it. But we believe that is not enough. Because, you know, just to say, okay, I'm just giving you an example. You've got an agent that speaks English and the other one speaks uh, uh, Spanish. Fair enough. You know, you, you can't send them, send the interaction that you can handle, right? That's, that's skill-based routing. But we're taking other elements into consideration, like your SLA. Have you picked up your phone within X seconds? Have you replied to that email within a couple of minutes? Whatever your, uh, your rules are as an organization. The second thing is business value. How important is each of these interactions? Because, you know, when you have a, a call coming in to cancel your credit card, it's probably much more important as a, a call coming in, you know, I would like to apply for a new credit card. So this is the, the business value that you attach to each of those interactions. The third uh, element is the waiting time of the customer. Because logic says, you know, the longer a customer waits, probably the, the, the more pissed off he is, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I assume that, right? And, and I'm sure that you would agree with it. And the fourth one, fourth one is really about how, how long has your agent been idle? Now, if you, if you look at these elements, we actually basically start now looking at each interact, uh, interaction and uh, and we have an algorithm that goes and calculates which age is the best suited for it. So if I'll give you a simple example, if a client is pissed off and is like waiting for a long time, um, we kind of know, well, we learn, I mean, not we, we kind of match it to the agent that have got the best uh, match, right? Yeah. And, um, and as an organization, we've got these le levers that you can push up and down. So if you are more client centric, which means you find, for instance, that the waiting time of a customer must, give a, must get a lot of value, you put the slider up. If you find that, for instance, that you don't want to, to break your SLAs, it's very important for you because you get measurement on it and maybe even get paid on it, then you put it higher. Very different ways of thinking. You know, one is very much client centric. The other one is more operational or company centric. So it actually kind of takes in this single waiting room, it actually prioritizes all this interaction, which is actually something that we're quite proud of and quite unique as well. And then we've got the next one, which is our AI learning or machine learning or AI routing, where it actually starts taking more things into consideration and literally looking at the past as well. So what it does, it starts trying to figure out uh, which customer is suited with best with each agent to achieve the highest customer satisfaction, meaning how happy is our customer. And the second measurement it is, has your, I mean, is a positive outcome of that interaction, being closing a sale or collecting money or whatever it, the, the, the agent is doing. And then what it does, it starts learning from the past, and then it, it starts matching the customer to the right agent, which is quite a, quite... The first step, what we call our first step in our AI journey, you know, AI is a very, very big word. You know, in my books, artificial intelligence is the moment when you can start thinking like a human being. Uh, and in our case, we prefer to call it machine learning, but a lot of people refer to it as AI. So this is what the, that concept of single waiting. So there's a three big differentiators, which, which, you, uh, which we're quite proud of. Does it make sense uh, what I said? Yeah, you? absolutely. Because I've been reading a lot about you guys. I also read a great quote where you said, uh, the vision was very simple. Let's create a contact center that's available for everyone. So can you tell me, or everybody listening, the story behind that vision and what set you out to transform this space? Well, you see, the, the thing is that, that you had, uh, you, you, there's two things that, that, if you look at the contact center providers out there, they're mainly focusing on the big corporates. Yeah. Um, and in effect, when you look at the SMEs or the SMBs, you know, the small, medium organizations, they actually end up with open source technology. They don't have really a choice because they can't afford it. They can't afford a uh, long in, uh, implementation time. 
and 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 we said there is a, a big gap there you know uh, let's let's provide a solution for that and uh, and as i explained to you previously the two things like easily accessible through a consumption based model pricing model and secondly you can register online and get going in, within a couple of minutes excellent so why do you think the call center is a channel often left out of marketing strategies and do you think and why do you think it's critical in providing that truly omni channel experience for customers that so many businesses are chasing after but making the same mistakes uh, you know, the, the one thing that, that we all have in common in every business is that we always want to serve as our clients, isn't it? Eh? So, yeah. and uh, that's the way, I mean, you do it, I do it, it doesn't matter, you know, uh, if you have a paint shop or a, or a bakery or a, or a multinational, you know, at the end of the day, you always have to give service to your, to your customers. So, it's something lots of organizations don't do well really and um, and in case so it, we need to have something out there that actually makes it uh, accessible you know i'm just going to give you a, a beautiful example where where we so the, 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 the and then there is a question is why does Zylab exist and the why is really want to create employment okay yeah so you've got this trend of offshoring you know contact sense to bpos you know to to out you know to other countries like Philippines and India and so forth. But that model is not working because it's been driven from a cost perspective, but not really from a from a from making sense perspective. A customer doesn't want to speak to somebody that has, that comes from a different culture, doesn't understand the, the product as well as, as as the person that lives in that country, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's a trend of bringing it back, right? Yeah. So what we've done in one of yeah. the townships, really absolutely fantastic. So in a township in, in South Africa, in the Western Cape, in fact, um, a lot of the agents that work in, in contact centers, they come from townships. And it's a career. Right. It's not uh, like in European countries sometimes that it's, uh, you know, it's a short time. Uh, you just do it because you have to do it. Right. Yeah. So and, and, and we went and, cre- and created uh, together with an, a nonprofit organization who had this building in the middle of a township, quite a beautiful, big building. And it had some classrooms in there. And, um, and, 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 and when I went to see it, they were they were selling airtime, you know, using a phone. Yeah. And when I saw that, I said, yeah. why can't we create a contact center in here? So we went and we, we, we actually put in some capital in there. We basically went to the city of Cape Town and they actually gave us some money as well to put into it, which was like, you know, I just wanted to get the buy-in from the city as well. And the story was simple. Why don't you create these contact centers in townships and let businesses like and outsource it to these people instead of actually let them travel all the way to town and spending four hours uh, every day, spending average between 20 or 30 percent of their salary just on, on, on transport and uh, and and the business model is as follows so i said don't go for the seat cost you know this traditional model is about you know i pay you a seat cost right so for one seat so and th- in this case i said also used consumption base so i went to all mutual and i said all mutual because of my relation with them i said outsource it to this bpo in in the township they call themselves uh, zoe incubation center and um, but for every minute that they pick up a phone call for you or for every or they're selling insurance or selling a loan that they actually get paid per minute the same way that we get paid for our for for our software so now suddenly what we've achieved, we created we created now a consumption based model where the the bpo client only pays for how much service is getting instead of a per seat cost and in this incubation center which was an 80 seater we basically have people that are uh, trained then they go into internship and then they work for a month and then they actually go home and they work from home. So we haven't gone to the home yet. We just now you know, did a phase one and, and it's really working so beautifully. And now it's not only old mutual that is keen to do it because it's got a nice story to it, but it's got a lot of business value. So now in, suddenly we are, we're creating this BPOs out of nothing, really, because the software is there in the cloud. We only get paid when somebody's using it. The agent only gets paid when when he's actually providing a service. And the quality assessors also only get paid when they're providing a service. The BPO gets a cut of it as well, only when they're providing a service. And the client only pays when they get a service. Do you get it, uh, Neil? Yeah. And it's quite beautiful. And that's something yeah. that we would love to replicate, not only in South Africa, but like in the United States and so forth. We have the same challenges everywhere else. 
So for anyone that's listening that's not heard of your Zy truck as well, can you tell them all about that incredibly cool all-terrain space truck converted from an 18-ton military truck uh, that's by your in- I think it was all created by your in-house industrial design team. I mean, you've got to share that. It's a great story. Have you seen it actually? Neil? Did yeah, you see the I've, truck? Seen, I've seen it. So. Uh, okay, okay. Now it's actually we were here at the Enterprise Connect uh, Expo, uh, and it was standing there. It was obviously an eye catcher. I think we we got a lot of attention. In fact, you know the, the you know I like sci-fi. I'm a sci-fi nerd really. And uh, if you look at our offices, the, you know when you walk in there, it looks like you walk into Star Trek. Um, and the reason I do that kind of stuff is from, from an office perspective, I do it because I want to attract talent, really, because we're all fighting for the same talent. So you create a nice environment. But on top of the truck, you know, was was something that, you know, I bought this six by six from the military and uh, and I was going to go and uh, convert into one of these campers and, and travel with my family. But never happened because my Zylab is just taking all my focus. And then and I have an industrial design team inside and I said, guys, can you make it look like a space truck? And they said, yeah, we can. So they started drawing it, and then it was on a computer. And then I said, okay, guys, you got six months. Let's build it. <laughs> and and these guys have done something phenomenal. So the truck, when it drives around, it stops everybody, and it regardless where where we are, because it traveled all the way through Africa, wow. uh, from South Africa all the way to Egypt, took the boat from Egypt to Italy, then drove from Italy to my hometown, Antwerp, where I was born. Then from there, it, it was on a ship to New York. And then from New York, it drove all the way down to Orlando. And then we started our expo. So it's it's an eye catcher. And it was simple for me, guys. We Nobody knows us. Uh, let's let's do, let's do you know let's get people to look at us and, and understand our DNA. And uh, it was a, a good marketing tool. And secondly, it creates also a culture of um, we can do anything, you know, in, in-house, you know, once we finished. And then suddenly writing software looks easy, isn't it? Yeah. So that's really the reason. So if you want to know more about it, just go hashtag Zytrack. It's plenty of it on the internet. Yeah, well, I'm going to get a video of that and put it on the show notes of here just so people can see how cool it is. Because I think it's fantastic what you've done, not only with that truck, but Thank also, you. like you said, you've used it as a marketing tool. And to think about yeah. logistically getting that tr- that space truck from Africa and getting it to where you are in Orlando now, I mean, that's phenomenal. And it, like you said, it shows you can do anything. Now, speaking of that, and of that I also read that you're a keen hiker who has summited Mount Kilimanjaro six times. Yeah. And you've created a culture of bringing <laughs> your own employees along with you to complete that challenge. So can you tell me more about that? And also the value that you, both you and your employees get from that experience? For sure. I think, you know, what it does, it's, it's, it's something magical, you know, that mountain does, you know, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a big believer in team building exercises, you know, uh, you know, when I see people going out and going to, you know, get pissed and all that jazz. Yeah, I believe, I always believe that the team has, has to be created in house, you know, you can't go for a piss contest and then think suddenly, oh, we've created a team, let's go back home, right? In this uh, trip to Kilimanjaro, every single time when I take my colleagues with me, when they come down the mountain, when they get to the top, and they, and it's tough. It's really, really tough. Even for myself, it's tough. Every time I say, I say to myself, why are you doing this again? But it's just beautiful to watch how, when they come down, how strong they feel, you know? You now there is a car hooting, and they feel like they can do anything, you know? They, it's again, it's a creation of uh, the right culture. So, And also during that time, I also get to know the person way better because you know, when we, when we are in misery, you know what happens? We become either very ugly or we, or we remain true to ourselves. So that's the reason. So And it works very, very well. So what are the top three things that you're working on over the next 18 months over there at the moment? So the, well, the first thing is really the a very cool thing is where we're going to start doing voice analytics. So basically, just imagine this. So as you're having the conversation with, uh, with your client, the system will start doing the quality assessment automatically. So it will start saying, have, has the client greeted? Have you greeted the client? It will tick it in front of the screen. Yeah. Have you uh, told about the, this product? Have you uh, been polite? And it will all happen interactively. And, um, and also it will give you a basically a percentage showing the chances that you will actually, uh, actually convert this loan, uh, convert this sale to a sale. So it's confidence, and then you basically can decide as an agent to actually either 
hang up the phone and said, uh, you know, kind of friendly and, and go to the next one. So this is quite revolutionary. The second thing is we really want to enhance our artificial intelligence, really add so much more to it. Uh, currently, like as I explained to you, it takes, uh, you know, uh, things from the past, but it, would, uh, but it only takes things into consideration currently that is that is inputted through the quality assessment, you know, and through your client survey. But we want to add more things to it, like things about the client himself, his gender, his sex, his age. So it actually becomes even more intelligent. And together with this voice analytics, it allows us to even get a higher accuracy to predict things like, you know, you, will you get the sale? Will you be able to collect? Great one is we're going to focus on a lot on, on, on CRM integration, uh, which we're lacking at this moment a little bit. So we want to grow in that. And those are the three top things, I would say. I've got many more than three, but anyway, those are the three, some three. <laughs> it certainly sounds you've got a busy year ahead. And I love the fact uh, that you've, you've done so well in Orlando this week. And you braved the, through you. the podcast listening to the uh, cars beeping in the background there. Adds a little bit of ambience, though, yeah. to the show, I think. Okay, <laughs> could, could you hear it? Okay, sorry. Man. <laughs> That's okay. But before I do let you go, can I just ask that you remind the listeners of your website details, your social channels, and how anybody listening can actually reach your team with any questions about anything we've talked about today? I really, I think it's 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 just www.zilab.com. It's Z-A-I-L-A-B.com, you know. Uh, don't get confused with a Chinese company out there that's called Zilab as well, fortunately. Then uh, if you want to know more about the truck, hashtag Zytruck, you will find a hell of a lot. And we've got quite a strong uh, content platform as well. We're releasing very soon a Zy News, basically a content platform, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, where you will have, uh, you will get to, to see, to, to, to know about our in the DNA and what we do, our product, et cetera, et cetera. So, but uh, the first thing I would say, just say Zylab.com is, is probably your best bet. Fantastic. Well, I really do wish you the best for the future. I love how you've took that space truck all the way from Africa to New York to Orlando. You really do show that anything's possible. And anybody out there with a startup sure. or just wants to make their voice heard, I think they could learn a lot from what you guys are doing. So a big thank you for coming on today. Thank you very much. Now, today's episode had to be cut short because I had a few episodes to record. But you know what? We chatted for an hour and it could I could have easily chatted to him for another hour or two. I mean, I love his story here and his passion for everything that he does. And also how he, he does everything a little bit differently. I mean, the logistics on their own of, of actually building and creating a space truck and then sending it in a container from South Africa all the way over to New York and then driving it down to Florida sounds insane on paper. But guess what? He captured everyone's attention at that event. And make no mistake, everyone knows who they are now. And that sounds better than just a business card or poster with a soulless booth number on, right? And I love how he invests in his team too and and takes them up to Kilimanjaro on a team building exercise. I mean, what a great guy. And someone who seems to be going around things in the right thing. But hey, that's my take. What are yours? Were you at that event? Did you see him at Universal Studios? Was that you and setting off your car alarm (laughs) while we were trying to record a podcast? As always, the answer to this, or if you want to just ask me a question, my doors are always open. And you can do that by going to my website, techblogwriter.co.uk slash podcast if you want to listen to any of the episodes. Email me, techblogwriter at outlook.com or tweet me at Neil C. Hughes. So now I'm going to go away and try and work out how I can get more listeners to this show or how I can get you guys to fill out a few ratings on iTunes, which can also help direct more people to our little community here. But that's it for today, I'm afraid. But boy, oh boy, do we have some good guests coming up this week. So stay tuned for more happy days. But until next time, don't be a stranger. Thanks for listening to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast. Until next time, remember, technology is best when it brings people together.